Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Father in heaven, we thank you for sending your son to die for us. We thank you that you've given us your word, Lord, that that shows of your goodness and your love for us. And we pray now for strength for Pastor Izzy, Lord. We pray that you would um, uh, use him, Lord, as a vessel to teach us this morning, to encourage us, Lord, to give us this day, what, what daily bread that we need, Lord, your son, uh, who came to die for us, to give us everlasting life. Lord, help open our eyes this morning. Keep the distractions away. Lord, let us keep all of our cares at your feet. Lord, you're the only one big enough to handle those cares anyway. Mm-hmm. Ask that now in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, guys, would you turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 8? We did the first three verses last week. The most, I think one of the most important passages of all Scripture, where we saw that love is greater than any other thing. I mean, without love to God, you, uh, you know, it says, if you, if you love God, then what's the, what, would, what did verse 3 tell us? then he knows you. And is that important that God know you? Yes, because it's the only thing going to get you in heaven. Jesus said in Matthew 7, verse 23, he's going to say one day, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. And there were people that, Jesus said they did miracles in his name. They cast out demons in his name. They did all these spiritual things but you can do those things and not love God. Do you r- recognize this? I mean, have you ever run into people that they're the spiritual do-gooders, but they don't have love? Anyone ha- had an experience with one of those? And you go, whoo, it's like sign of the cross, get back, you know. It's scary because love is so important. Now, Paul said in the beginning of this chapter, knowledge makes arrogant. It puffs you up, but love builds you up. It edifies. And knowledge we're just all growing. I mean, it's the best to understand in verse 2, he says, if any man supposes he knows anything, you don't know yet as you ought to know. We're just all works in progress in what we know and, and growing, hopefully, in our knowledge of the Lord. But Paul started this chapter by saying, now concerning idols. Now remember, Paul, in the beginning of chapter 7, said that as to the things you wrote to me about, Here's some answers for the questions that you had. And chapter 8 really shouldn't have a distinction. There shouldn't be a break because it's still a continuation of Paul answering their questions. You know, they had, they, they had questions about living together in, you know, outside of marriage. Uh, is that allowed? Things like that. And, and now they're coming to questions about is it okay, like, to eat at a... Um, well, the corner diner that has an idol in it that they do really good ribs, but they... Remember, Paul, they're in Corinth, okay? And for those of you who don't know the ancient history, the Corinthians were very heavily influenced by the Grecian Empire. They came... They're right, right, right at this time as a transition from the Grecian Empire to the Roman Empire. But the Greeks had that polytheistic society. They had Hermes and Zeus and Aphrodite, all these different gods and goddesses. And you know, they had their own worship at these different places. People would bring animals and they would give sacrifices and lest the animal go to waste, you know what they did was they took the the meat around the back, cut it up, had a nice fire roasting, and then they sold the, um, what we call barbecue. You know, they had barbecue. And so if you grew up in a culture where you, anyone grew up where you had good barbecue? I mean, if, if you've grown up where you had really good barbecue, it only takes the smell, right? I mean, when you smell some good meat cooking, and it, for those of you that are vegetarians, I'm sorry, but for us meat eaters, this is a trigger. Because all it takes, right, is a good smell of that meat coming in the smoke, and you're just like, oh, let's go get it, you know? And, and you're off to, you're, it's time to eat. And, and so if you grew up in Corinth, where at different places of worship, they, they actually became known for Maybe the ribs is at one place over here. They got the really good steaks over here, you know. And 
and they actually, you know, you if you grew up in their culture, some of them actually worship that god or that goddess, but it, even if you didn't, now when I say god or goddess, I'm saying with a little g, not high deity, but men's idea of gods. And Paul's going to point this out in just a minute because he, the question was, am I allowed to go eat some meat over at, you know, whatever, Aphrodite's temple because they're having ribs today or something, you know, and, and they always have it cheap and it's really good. And if you grew up eating this all the time and now you become a Christian, do all of a sudden you say, I don't want to have any more ribs just because you gave your heart to Christ? No, I mean, the ribs still smell good and you still want to go eat and Someone wrote a question, am I allowed to go eat over at Aphrodite's temple and, you know, or can I go over here to Zeus's hangout and have some steak or, you know, is it, is, and Paul is going to give a perspective that is one that is so mature. It's only, he learned it from Jesus. I'll show you it in a minute, but he is going to explain that it doesn't, it's not about the food. It's about our fellow brother because the first command is love God all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength. And the second command, like unto the first, is what? Love thy what? Neighbor as what? As thyself. Let me show you. Paul just said, knowledge isn't really king. Love is. And we have to continue to grow in love, not just to God, but to our neighbor. So even when it comes to the dining at a temple, understand the perspective has to be looked at through a filter of love. Do you love your fellow brother? And I'll show you how he points it out. Let's read this together. Look at verse 4. It says, Therefore concerning the eating of things sacrificed to idols. We know, he says, that there is no such thing as an idol in the world and that there is no God but one. You know in the book of Levit Leviticus it says, that the Lord thy God is one God. There's only one God, one true God of the creator of the heavens and the earth, the, the entire universe is God the Father, with a capital G. Some people ask me, why, does, why is there but one God with a capital G here? And then if you read the next verse, verse five, it says, for even if there are so-called gods with a little g, that means they're not true deity, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and there are many lords. There are many things that people make into their gods. Many things that master them as lord over their lives. Yet for us, he says, there is but one God, the Father, from whom are all things. We exist for him. And there is one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom, he says, are all things. However, he says, not all men have this knowledge. But some being accustomed to the idol until now, they eat food as if it were sacrificed to the idol. And their conscience, being weak, is defiled. But Paul says, but food will not commend us to God. We're neither worse if we do not eat, nor better if we do eat. But he says, but take care, lest this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. Paul says, you know, they could have sacrificed this animal to their little god with a little g. And it's nothing because it's no god at all. I mean, he, in Paul's mind, it could have been a rock that they, they butchered the animal in front. He didn't care if it was a carving of a statue of some god or goddess they made up. Because it's no god in his mind at all. There's only one god. And that animal is still good meat. And so he had no trouble with eating it. But Paul says, not everyone has this knowledge. And so he says, take care that it's a liberty that you have a freedom to eat that meat. If your conscience doesn't bother you, remember when we studied in Romans, back when we were doing Romans 14, that if you can eat it in faith, it's not sin, it's okay. But even in Romans 14, it says, be careful that you don't eat anything or drink anything that stumbles what? Your brother. Do we love our brother enough to not eat or drink something in front of him so that they would not be stumbled? I mean, if you, 
if you're a meat eater and you're going out to lunch with a vegetarian, a known vegetarian, I mean a true hardcore vegetarian, and you know that it will really bother them that you order a hamburger. Do you care more about your little palate of your tongue to eat that burger today than you care about your brother or sister being stumbled? Can you not just have a salad or some vegetarian option for one meal? Now, I know some of you are going, oh, God, I don't want to do it. But we're talking about love your neighbor as what? Yourself. And we don't want to stumble our neighbor. Jesus said, if you stumble even the least, the littlest of ones, it's better for you to get a millstone and make it into a puka shell necklace because that's what it is. It's a big stone like this, about six feet, small ones, about six feet across, about this high, big hole down the middle, little hole on the side, goes down underneath, big spot for a, a huge beam to hang out, and they hook the oxen to it, and the oxen walks in circles, or the mule, and pushes the stone in a circle, and they drop the grain down the outer hole, and it goes underneath the stone, and just from the sheer weight of this thing, being ground across on another piece of stone, the, the grain slips underneath and it squishes it and it comes out the edge as fine flour. That's what a millstone is. Now Jesus says, it's better if you get one of those and just hook it up to your little puka shell necklace, make a nice necklace, this is your centerpiece, and go swim in the deepest part of the ocean than it is that you stumble the least of my brethren. Is Jesus think it's important not to stumble somebody? If you put a 6,000-pound stone on your neck and try to swim, guess where you're going? Down. <laughs> Jesus said it would be better for you to do that than to stumble your brother. But we don't actually... I mean, how many of you have heard those words of Jesus before? You heard that. You're not supposed to stumble your brother, right? But people don't really picture the full ramifications Jesus is saying it's better to go swim with that necklace on and be drugged to the deepest part of the ocean than it is for you to stumble your brother. He means don't stumble your brother. I'm pretty sure that's what it means. Not really further, you know, eschatology required. It's plain. Don't stumble your brother or sister. But Paul, Paul had this same answer to the church at Corinth because they were like, well, can we eat at the temple over there, and Paul's like, you can if it doesn't what? Stumble your brother or sister. But not everyone has this understanding, he says. And he goes on, look, look what he says. He says, for if someone sees you, verse 10, ha that have knowledge, dining in the idol's temple, will not his conscience, if, if he's weak, now if he's, if he's got the same understanding like, hey, it's it's no real God at all. It doesn't matter. It's just some meat. It doesn't defile me. I eat meat. We're, you know, I see you eating meat. It doesn't bug me. But if he's weak, it says, if he sees you eating in the idol's temple, will his conscience be strengthened to eat things sacrificed to idols? Paul says, for through your knowledge, he who is weak is ruined. The brother for whose sake Christ died and so by sinning against the brethren and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. He says, therefore, if food causes my brother to stumble, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause my brother to stumble. Now, this is a conviction I don't know if I have. I mean, I like my ribs and my steaks. And if you're vegetarian, I'm not saying that to stumble you. I'm just saying, I do. I don't eat them sacrificed to idols. But, you know, we do cook them on the Kamado. And it's a clay oven shaped like an egg. Makes really good meat. Especially on Keave wood. Or mesquite if you're from the Midwest. And I, I mean, Paul, he really has the, he has the right heart. I need to work on this. He says, if food would cause my brother to stumble, I won't eat meat again. For me, I look at it like if it causes you to stumble, I won't eat it in front of you. 
I'm still working on never eating it again because it's kind of, I like it. And I don't mean to say that to stumble anyone, honestly. But I'm just telling you that, do you see the heart of Paul? He's like, if it would cause my brother to, st this is, this is a guy who understands the necklace with the millstone analogy. If it would cause my brother to stumble, would I really be willing to stop it? Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com, and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo and God bless.